Now, from this next man, we, ner- we learned to uh, never lick a gift horse in the mouth. Financial Phil uh, joins us. <laughs> Phil, good morning to you. Or licking, morning, his, or licking the horse either. Don't, don't yeah. lick a gift horse in the mouth. Uh, Phil was no, busy sir, never do that. this weekend. Uh, s- some success for the Musselman volleyball team this week. Phil, where were you guys? We were in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. A lot of driving for uh, for the parents of Musselman and the kids in Musselman volleyball. But it was, uh, we were at Myrtle Beach for the first tournament of the year. And how the girls do? They won. They uh, surprisingly, because you know there's a lot of new faces on that team, and uh, not necessarily new faces, but new positions. You know, they lost a lot of seniors last year. And, you know, going down to a tournament with really good competition. And, you know, early on we're watching, you know, some of these other teams playing with, oh, boy, <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a long weekend. But uh, after the second match, was, those girls seemed like they had played together for years. And uh, they played really well the last three and ended up winning the tournament. How so, many how many new kids them. are on the team this year, Phil? Well, I don't know. I, I, to say the uh, new kids, because a lot of them were there, whether they were swing players, there's a there's a freshman that is, is making a lot of noise. Uh, so she was not a swing player last year. She's a, she's a freshman, but the rest of them, you know, they were they were either playing a different position or or on the team in some role last year. But now they they're they're in they're in the rotation and playing on the high school level. You know, playing for the first time for the you know, meaningful reps anyway so there's there, there's a lot there's a lot of new faces and, and they seem to uh, come together as the tournament went on was the tournament invitational phil you know i i don't know i don't know if it's a, it, probably not because it's the tournament was called battle of the border between north carolina and south carolina and a team from west virginia came down and, and won it i think it was probably invite only because the team that ran it they play in a they play them often in another tournament that they'll go to later in the year in Charleston, South Carolina. So a handful of those teams they're, they're familiar with, Muslim programs familiar with, because they play them at a tournament in Charleston, South Carolina every year. So my guess is, and I don't know this, my guess is they said, hey, we're having a tournament next year. Well, won't you guys come down to it sort of thing. How long is the season? How many games over how many months? Uh, the, they'll finish up, uh, the, the state tournament is early November and that's the end of it. And they'll end up playing approximately 50 matches. Just depends on, you know, how many of them go extra sets and so forth, but they'll, they'll end up playing approximately 50 matches. Is there a spring league too? Cause it doesn't feel like that long ago that we were talking about volleyball last. Well, there's travel and, you know, the travel league is completely different where, you know, these, these girls, especially locally, are, are, are playing for travel teams and you know you'll see um you know for example on the team that i coached i had two kids from musselman one from spring mills one from martinsburg and one from hedgesville and um so they, they kind of they all know each other and for a large part they play with each other in the off season but they scatter you know there there's some playing in dc some playing in Chambersburg and Hagerstown and, you know, the large part of Winchester with Blue Ridge and in some place right here at home in the Ecan. So there's a, in, in the Eastern Panhandle. So there, there's a, there, they all play in the um, fall slash winter and it, it rolls right into summer. Uh, so they do, they, they do all play in off season just for different teams. We televise matches on TV 10. Uh, I just, texted dylan uh, about uh, when our first one is i'm not sure if he's able to find the schedule thursday. just yet thursday was our first one thursday, thursday. yep musselman and spring mills yep that's the uh dylan i think it, it may be yep, the Mus- first yep. local on yeah. thursday yep who's on the call this year for those games on tv 10 dylan uh, it's going to be me on i believe we've we worked out a schedule all tuesday games will be me and jim klein and all thursday games will be either colin mclaughlin or nick verzellini with jim klein all right, so Jimbo Jim Klein is uh, the analyst. He's the coach. Uh, I think he won several state championships in Maryland when he was a volleyball coach. And uh, and Dylan will be great. I'm, I'm Thanks, Ralph. Sucking up to Dylan because he's going to leave us soon to go back to substitute teaching. I think. <laughs> when when is your la- last day this week producing? Uh, starting this week, I'll be in here on Mondays and Tuesdays producing with you. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Collins back. Yeah. All right. Very good. Collins good too. All right. Well, thank you, Dylan. You're welcome. And uh, back to financial Phil here. Phil, so some huge news out of Chicago where the Bears cut one of their backup quarterbacks, potentially freeing a roster spot for Shepard alum Tyson Bajant. 
Yeah, and that's no surprise. I'm glad they did that because it would have been a terrible mistake to leave him on the practice squad. But, man, it's, a, it's an exciting time for Shepard. I, I know Ronnie Brown and Fisher, they're still on the roster from the last I've checked anyway. And I don't know what their chances are. Be Tyson's gotten more attention. But he lit it up in the, uh, in the preseason, and it looks like he's the potential two, maybe three. I don't know. It, and I don't know that that really matters. But it, it's looking – most likely he's going to be on that active roster and that couldn't be a, from a local guy. And then, you know, me being a shepherd, shepherd grad and him going to shepherd, it's, uh, it's cool, man. And, you know, everybody seems excited about him. And if you want to see something, I just think this is really neat. If you go to a Chicago bears message board or sports page and every fan, he is the, <laughs> he is the fan favorite. They love him in Chicago. Uh, we may never see Tyson again. I know I saw something where he's coming here for a signing or something, but they love, love him in Chicago. So it, it's really cool to see that. And, and hopefully the other guys, if it's not with the team that they're on right now, that they land somewhere because I think they both had uh, very respectable showings. Now, both of those teams last I checked, and this may not be that current, I checked last night before I went to bed, both Fisher and Ronnie Brown in Tampa, it was a, Ronnie Brown with Tampa and uh, Joey Fisher with the 49ers, uh, they've been through a round of cuts, and their names weren't on there. So that that's a good sign, too. So maybe at least practice squad or something. I don't, I don't really know where they stand as much as Tyson because he's gotten so much attention. But, you know, congrats to all three of those guys. It's an accomplishment in itself. You know, I played football and couldn't imagine had going to a, um, you know, a, a pro um, offseason or preseason. I would have been – I would have been beaten to death. So it's an accomplishment in itself for them to make it there and to make it through. Wow, it, it, it's it's really cool. I'm excited for them. Yeah, very nice. Everyone's uh, in Martinsburg very excited as well. Once uh, that news got out that P.J. Walker had been cut by the Bears, uh, folks in Martinsburg were uh, very quick to celebrate uh, the fact that Tyson could be on an NFL roster. And that's uh, that's really something. I'm, you know, not a Division One scholarship offered to him, as we understand it, not drafted, yet he could be one injury away from being in an NFL game on a Sunday. Yep. So back to the markets. Phil, Friday was a big day because of Jackson Hole, the Fed getting together, deciding what they're going to do about interest rates going forward. What do we know? Uh, what came out of Friday, and it looks like our markets have baked in what he said, but what stood out to me the most, and John Grillstrap and I had thought of this as before as well, too, is this target inflation at 2%. We had both said, um, you know, what's to stop them from saying, hey, look, we're 2.5%, we're good, or we'll, we'll settle in at 3% because everything looks like the employment market's still doing well. Jerome Powell reiterated and doubled down, we're going to get to 2%, and we're willing to do more work in order to, to get there. Uh, meaning one more, maybe another int- rate increase later this year. And, you know, reiterated what he's been saying all along, we're data dependent. So depending on what this, the data that comes out in the in the future months will determine what they do. And, you know, the job jobs numbers have become, once again, he even alluded to it, good news is bad news sort of thing. You know, the stronger those job numbers look, that's an inflationary pressure. And I remember talking about this, and people don't like it, but it's true. A really, really strong job market is an inflationary pressure, and that may be the last part of this sticky inflation, the very last bit of it that they need to bust through. And our jobs market does still look pretty good. So now when that jobs report comes out on Thursday, it's going to be meaningful, and it very well could be good news is bad news, bad news is good news yet again. I hate that. I hate that narrative, but it, that, that is the case in this situation that we live in, in right now. But what stood out to me the most, again, was he re- reiterated and doubled down on that 2% been the target, and they're not coming off of that. Is he making a mistake being so hung up on the 2% interest? Is he, is he willing to affect the lives of thousands, maybe millions of people adversely for that 2% inflation mark? Well, I think, in, in my opinion, and I think the way that they view it is if inflation, and we saw that the last CPI rating, if it starts to tick back up, and it gets out of hand, overwhelming inflation impacts everyone. And a softening job market only impacts a handful, right? And and most notably in this environment, it's entry and exit level positions. And what I mean by entry and exit level is, you know, you think of a a high school or college worker that's working a part-time job uh, to either pay tuition or just spending cash or 
someone that's in retirement already, but they, they just they just want to get out and do something, or maybe they're saving money for a trip or whatever it may be. I'm just filling my time on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday from 8 to 12 or something along those lines. So those are entry and exit level positions, and that's where we've seen a lot of the wage increases, and that is the part of the markets that they're thinking of that, in my opinion, that they, they think that they can slow down uh, somewhat and and impact inflation and so therefore if it does the the ones that it impacts i'm sure there'll be some out there that rely on those paychecks but in their mind for the greater good for every single person that's going to be impacted by runaway inflation or if inflation starts to go back up to where it was uh, earlier in the year or god forbid where it was this time last year then the the for the greater good and the worst of the evils is a softening job market Phil, I uh, reading in either the Wall Street Journal or Washington Post uh, over the weekend, uh, President Biden's big push of trying to bring jobs home, uh, and he's uh, uh, courting the unions uh, to, in order to do this. Uh, to me, that would be, it's admirable, and on the long term, it's something that we should be doing. But it would also, I think, uh, run counter to trying to reduce inflation. Am I correct in this read? Uh, yeah, to some extent, and, and it is, but those aren't really the jobs that are, are causing the bigger issues. Those aren't really the entry and exit level jobs that, that are, are the labor market is so tight with right now. But on one hand, it is, it is still, you know, the tighter the labor market, it's an inflationary pressure. But overall, let's, let's think of this, you know, that soft landing that we talk about, essentially what that means is, we have slowed the economy. We have brought down inflation without going into a recession. So if, if they can do that while we're bringing – if we're bringing jobs home, and if that's successful, if we're bringing jobs home and keeping a healthy employment market and all the while inflation continues to come down, that's what we've seen for the most, most part of the year, not the last inflation reading, not the last jobs report, but that is what we have seen for the majority of the year. Inflation has come down and maintained a healthy job market. It softened some, but it's still a healthy workplace and or a workplace environment and job market. If if they can accomplish that, if that you know, what if they have to go two more rate increases? Well, okay. Well, okay. We do one quarter of a percent and then do another one maybe at the beginning of 2024. If that happens, and so we've got three three narratives: higher rates, uh, job market health, and inflation. If the highest, if higher rates have to be maintained to to achieve the other two, then so be it. I think everybody would be okay with that because that is the smallest amount of MP, people negatively impacted. Yeah, it's going to hurt the housing market, probably hurt the auto market. Um, so it would, it would hurt those some. But you also, on the flip side, you also have those cash savers or the cash uh, returns that are now somewhat attractive. And by cash, I mean time deposit, CD, savings account, flex savings, whatever, whatever we call it, but cash holdings are getting pretty decent returns now. And so for those, uh, mostly retirees, but for those people, all this has been a good thing. They're not borrowing money anymore. They're in retirement, and now they've got cash, and, and they're holding on to it, and they're getting a decent return in, in those. Now, I would always argue uh, the, the flip side to that is we have to keep in mind that Cash rates never, for the long term, keep up with the pace of inflation. But in this environment, at least it's something good that's coming out of it. So these, these three factors that, that all revolve around the Federal Reserve, if, if they have to keep rates higher longer, and that's something he had said before as well, if they have to keep rates higher longer to avoid a recession and, and accomplish a soft landing, then that's what they'll do. You know, this is what makes me crazy about all of this. It seems to me that it takes government intervention to really create runaway inflation. Uh, we've, we've gone for, what, a, de a decade with essentially zero inflation uh, for in, in across the board. So in every other element of, of financial analysis, whether it's a stock market or anything else, we expect to have corrections. And if we stay focused on a number, whatever the number is, 2%, 3%, if we just artificially choose a number and then we ruin stuff in order to get it, I, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is a long question, if, 
if we just got out of the way at wherever we are now, four or five percent inflation, I think it's about three, three percent inflation. We just got out of the way and let market forces do what market forces do. It's like water finds its own level. The economy finds its own level. The the inflation issue would settle down, wouldn't it? If government just stepped back and said, OK, we're, we're done playing with the numbers. Y'all y'all go play nicely. It, it it would it would be more natural for sure, and I'm sure we would run in <clears throat> we would run into those issues. But you're 100 percent correct that this inflation problem was created by monetary and fiscal policy in response to COVID. And you know we've done this in 08 and 09 as well with the banking crisis. But this was created, and, and we, there's a, a ton of arguments about hey, what called this inflation? Well, everybody's right with what they say called this inflation. It's just that all of those issues, whether it was the PPP loans and then the enhanced unemployment and the money that we got, the checks that we had gotten in order to keep our economy. So what they had said, their decision was in April of 2020 was, let's entice everyone that as when we start to reopen, people are willing to spend money. And, and that's what they did. So they made sure everyone had money. And that stuff lasted all the way out until 2021 and there was no reversal of some of those decisions because they wasn't they weren't quite sure this is the reasoning they weren't quite sure the path of covid we were still in this where we had this fear that we would get sent back home again so how can we increase rates and tighten the budget again in order to slow down to prevent this run or this inflation that we had last year this year as well to prevent that how can we do that when we don't know? What if something happens and we have to go back home again? But this was a self-made problem in response to COVID, and only time will tell. If we can, if we can accomplish a soft landing, I think they would say, hey, our, our whole policy, fiscal and monetary policy in response to COVID was a success if we can do, do it and accomplish a soft landing. That soft landing is something that is debated back and forth every day on on the perception of whether we can accomplish this or not. But if we can accomplish it, then I think everyone will say, hey, the, the, the actions that we took, it was successful. We kept our economy going. Yeah, we had some bad inflation for a little bit, but we brought it back down, and we didn't go into a recession. But if we go into a recession, we'll start to revisit some of those decisions back in April of 2020. There's some uh, some thought that COVID may be coming back this uh, this fall. Uh, the playbook that was written uh, uh, during the big COVID years. Uh, do you think that parts of that playbook will be followed? Should we find another uh, heavy dose of COVID? Uh, you know what? I don't. I don't. My my feeling is, and it's just a personal feeling. I have no expertise on it. But we're so weary of COVID and and the vaccines and. And going, I don't, I don't think we'll be sent home again, and I don't think we'll be sent home again because our economy can't withstand it. Uh, I, I, I feel that way back in April of 2020. If our economy, if they didn't have the ability to influx our economy and our citizens and, and, our, and our consumers with cash, I don't think they ever would have done it. I think we would have dealt with it in a different manner. But because they were, we were in a position in order to do that, that's why they, they enticed our economy so much. So this time around, if it, if it does come back up and if it's as dangerous as it was before, I don't think we'll react to it the same way to it simply because we can't take it. We can't. We, I don't, and I don't know that our – and this isn't a financial um, opinion, but I don't know that our citizens would take it. I, I think there would be some sort of rebellion and we would be less likely to follow the rules and the masking and, all, and the vaccines and all that. I think they're – um, I think those days are probably done as it pertains to COVID. Also, Just a personal opinion. I, I, I think that state legislatures and the Supreme Court has clipped the wings of a lot of administrators, you know, governors and, and the president in order to enforce um, the, the draconian COVID uh, overreach, I'll say. But, um, I, God, I hope nobody tries to do that. Although I have read that mask mandates are coming back in certain schools and businesses. Yeah, I mean, the mask mandates may not surprise me. I just don't know how much people would follow them or how much uh, enforcement uh, of those that would actually go on. You know, there's a lot of rules that aren't really enforced. It's kind of like jaywalking in a way. They're not really enforced that much. But uh, but in my personal opinion, not a financial opinion, but citizens wouldn't follow those mandates as strictly as they did before. I mean, I, I remember 
in my in my memory anyway, it was only three years ago, but almost everybody, even if they didn't agree with it, did what they were supposed to do as far as masking and keeping their distance. They may not have liked it, but they did it for the most part. I just don't see that that would be the case this time around. Phil, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. We'll talk to you again tomorrow morning at 638.